Welcome to the Texas Conflict Coach radio program. If you have ever experienced or engaged in destructive or unresolved conflict, then you know it leads to broken relationships, distrust, and damaging results. Our program will help you manage and resolve conflict effectively with strategies, valuable resources, and support. I am your host, Patty Porter. My guest hosts, Dina Zametta and Stephen Kotev, along with our guest experts, will share our experiences, raise your awareness, and give you food for thought. We will share with you problem-solving strategies, no matter what your situation is, at work with neighbors or friends, family or partners. Tune in or join in the conversation every Tuesday evening. People aged 65 and older make up a fast-growing part of the population, and many families confront sometimes difficult decisions about caregiving, housing, health care, estate planning, and end-of-life planning for aging parents and other family members. In this episode, we talk to Bob Rudy, President of Senior Mediation and Decision Making Inc. in Baltimore, Maryland. You will learn how senior or elder mediators can help your family manage and resolve conflicts in these matters. Robert J. Rudy is in private practice as a lawyer, mediator, facilitator, and consultant, and has been President of Senior Mediation and Decision Making Inc. in Baltimore, Maryland since 2007. He is a past chair of the Association for Conflict Resolution's Elder Mediation Section, and Bob also developed and directed the Maryland Senior Mediation Project. Bob created and directed the Maryland Court of Special Appeals Office of Mediation, and throughout his career, Bob has provided senior mediation training and consulting around the United States and Canada. Tonight, we have our chat room open at Blog Talk Radio, www.blogtalkradio.com backslash Texas-conflict-coach. And we invite you to participate in our Twitter feed using hashtag TCC Radio. My name is Tracy Colbreth, and I am co-hosting with founder Patty Porter this evening. I would like to welcome listeners to the program, as well as our guest Bob Rudy and co-host Patty Porter. Thank you, Tracy. Welcome, Bob. Hi, Patty. Tracy, thank you. Glad to be with you. Thank you both for being here. Uh, Bob, so we have some questions. We'd like to get to know a little bit about you. What drew you to working with older people, and where did it take you in your career as a mediator? You know, I grew up in the in Virginia, at, in homes at different times, living with two sets of grandparents, and I was very close to them and their other aging relatives and neighbors in our out in our small town. I think that's probably why, real early in my law and public policy practice in the early 70s, a part of my career always involved working from that time on with uh, on behalf of elder persons. I, I in uh, the mid 70s, I was a lobbyist uh, with Ralph Nader for passage of a nursing home reform bill by the Iowa General Assembly. Uh, one of my early clients uh, in Des Moines, Iowa, in my private law practice, was the Iowa Commission on Aging. And then a few years later, in the early 80s, my father died early, in, in his early 70s. And three or four years after that, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and I had moved back close to 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 them, and I became her caregiver, worked with our family, uh, her brothers and sisters and uh, health care providers and eventually nursing home facilities. And my experience working with her, talking with her, learning how even in the late stages of that of that disease, uh, she trained me in many ways in terms of what I think I've been doing since uh, in senior mediation and, and working frequently with families where where uh, an aging parent uh, or other family member has Alzheimer's. So uh, I, later on, I became interested in end-of-life issues and, and served as a volunteer at a hospice for a year's time, working with 24 uh, families as they were going through that process. So I got involved in mediation when I was uh, through... Uh, our dear friend Rachel Wall and Chief Judge Bell in uh, the late 
around 1998 when Rachel and Judge Bell set up a Maryland Alternative Suit Resolution Commission to try to expand uh, ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, Mediation, and all those approaches in our state. And uh, they asked me to serve on the commission. I ended up hanging out with a bunch of mediators and became really interested. I was running a, a, a legal services program at the time and became really interested in it and um, left uh, that uh, position in uh, the end of 2003. One of, I realized that one of the things that we had not done in Maryland as we did a lot of work to expand the use of ADR in our state. We really hadn't talked about the needs of, of older people. And uh, I went at that time uh, to the Maryland Department of Aging and the Maryland Mediation and Conflict Resolution Office, MACRO, so a state entity in the judiciary, and uh, proposed creating the, a, the Maryland uh, Senior Mediation Pilot Project and uh, did that for three or four years, learned about what was going on around the country in senior mediation, uh, tried to develop best practices in our state. We tried to learn how to do it, how it could be useful, trained ourselves, did a lot of mediations, worked with the court, worked with uh, the local and state departments on aging, worked with a lot of mediators, community mediators, private mediators, and eventually with mediators and, and similar programs around the country. So that's that's it in a, in a long nutshell. Thank you for sharing that. That's amazing how your experiences around all of those individuals early in your life have paved your passion and paved your way in this field of uh, elder mediation and dealing um, with these issues. So that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. Well, you know, that's what I was thinking too, Tracy, about, you know, this this rich experience that, you know, that you've had, Bob. And um, so let's clarify with listeners, um, you know, we've had the topic of elder mediation before, um, you know, on the program. And, um, and I noticed that you use senior mediation. So what, first of all, clarify, is there a distinction between senior or elder? Is it just uh, interchangeable senior or elder mediation? And how is it different from other types of mediations that people do, whether it's divorce mediation or workplace mediation? Sure. There's no difference. Uh, I see both phrases. When I started this project, uh, uh, started developing it in mid-2004, I was seeing the phrase senior mediation more often. I see elder mediation more often now. Uh, we started seeing the phrase in the mid-1980s. Uh, AARP was very uh, involved in early uh, promotion of the concept of using mediation around on behalf of older people and around senior issues. Uh, mediation, as I'm sure your guests mostly, your listeners mostly know, it's just a process where a, a, a neutral, a, a, a party who, who is involved in the conflict uh, helps people come together to talk and listen to each other. And usually when there's some problems, there's a there's a, a difficulty reaching a decision. Maybe you maybe call it a conflict or just a difficult conversation that need to be had. And it's, uh, it's going to be voluntary. People choose to do it. Sometimes courts are ordering mediation, but it doesn't order people to settle. It orders people to come to the table. Uh, and it's confidential. Uh, whoever's involved has to come up. Everybody's got to come up for a decision themselves to to agree. And and it's not just negotiation. We mediators try to try to get to what we call win-win solutions, where everyone walks away feeling like they they've gotten what they need to to move forward and make their decisions. The uh, uh, there are a lot of wonderful community volunteer mediators and mediation programs around the country, and a lot of professional mediators who do this as a full-time or at least a big part of their their professional activity, and they come from a, a lot of different walks of life. Senior mediation or elder mediation, they start off with, say, the 60 years or, or older. Like Tracy said the 60, 65 demographics is the fastest growing in the country. Uh, we're getting older. The movers are getting older. The fastest growing sector percentage-wise is 85 and older, so that's really growing a lot as well. Smaller numbers, but proportionally we're growing a lot. We're staying a lot longer, and uh, and there's more decisions to make, and uh, families are working together to help to help make decisions and, and make sure that the, the, the quality of life in those later years is, 
is is good. Um, so there are when we talk about people sixty and older, we are aware that as we age, some of us uh, at one time or another, most of us at some point, if we live long enough, are going to go through some uh, impairments of hearing, sight, mobility. Um, the uh, 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 cognitive uh, impairment is something that I encounter in the mediation that I do. It's not just Alzheimer's, but people maybe have a harder time engaging in communications and conversations as they get older or understanding what's going on. In mediation, we try very hard to make sure that the people that are going to be affected by the decisions that are being made are involved in those decisions to the greatest extent possible. So we, uh, in our training for senior mediators and our approaches to senior mediation, we try to learn what kinds of accommodations may be necessary to help make sure that everyone can participate as, as much as possible to the fullest extent possible. There's also, uh, we'll talk more about this in a minute, Tracy in, my, in the intro to the program hit some of them. There's a, a types of issues that uh, we encounter with more frequency around transitions that go with aging, that uh, uh, it is useful for a person who works with individuals and families and institutions and organizations around senior mediation issues are aware of those types of legal issues, uh, services, institutions, organizations, and can help people determine what information they need about uh, housing uh, opportunities, uh, uh, health care facilities, uh, geriatric care providers, and uh, the uh, guardianships and powers of attorney and uh, health care directors and those kinds of things. I think it's very, very helpful, useful, I think, uh, for a senior mediation to bring, a mediator to bring into the mediation process and awareness of those issues and uh, entities and uh, things that's going to be encountered to help come to the decisions uh, to, to resolve the decision uh, or to end the conflict. So there's a number of things that were there, and we're going to delve a little bit more into some of those issues, and Tracy will be going into that with you. Um, let me make sure that I understand um, for the listeners here that the distinction between a, a basic mediation that they've learned over time through the program and senior elder care mediation uh, obviously is that a really unique aspect, and, and not to mention including the, the elder person themselves in the mediation, uh, but there's a number of things that you have to consider as a mediator when you're working with these families is what types of impairments that might need accommodations, what are the resources, uh, whether they're in the community that not might be involved in the mediation or that you might need to tap into regarding transitions uh, and, and, and institutions. And there's a number of issues that you've already mentioned. You kind of mentioned, you know, if there was cognitive function going on. Um, so that was the biggest distinction I heard uh, between a, a norm or a regular type of mediation and senior and elder care is you're, you're really dealing with some very unique uh, issues. So, Tracy, why don't you delve de deeper a little bit more with that. Yes. Can you share some of the type of issues, Bob, that is addressed in senior mediation? Uh, you mentioned some briefly, but can you dive into one specific dispute or give us an example? Sure. Let me just, if I may, hit, a, hit the calendar for a bit and then we'll talk particularly. The one that I've worked most in, and more than any other is family caregiver conflict. That's, uh, And I'll talk about a kind of a an example of a case without getting into absolute specifics on it and, and maintain confidentiality of the, certainly the, the parties involved. Uh, family caregiving is the, the, the biggest single area that I, I work in. Estate planning, I see business transfers, property transfers, you know, making uh, uh, wills uh, that may involve disparate uh, allocation of resources, how the families come together and recognize that some family members may need more assistance uh, after the passage of a, of, a, of a parent than others. How do you feel about that so that there's not going to be a, a will contest that dissipates the entire estate after a, after the, the person passes on? Elder divorce. I've seen nursing homes where 
divorces where one of the parties in the early 80s in the, in the nursing home, the other party's out spending the resources and running, running around in your, in your relationship. It's kind of different. Grandparent visitation where parties, their children get uh, divorced and the grandparents want to continue having relationships with the grandkids. Uh, what's there in hospice conflicts, nursing home conflicts, uh, end-of-life uh, decision-making, uh, where people literally come together and, and, and sit and talk with their family over uh, final health care dis- decisions around uh, um, care at the, the end of their, their life. Those are some of the issues I've, I've seen and I've, I've worked in all of these and some others. Housing conflicts, uh, 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 family members coming back into the house sometimes with kids to an older parent and how you work out the, the housing situation when the, when, uh, when kids come back home into the house with uh, 70 and 80 year old parents. Um, the case that type of case I've seen the most is uh, oh making decisions frequently where there is a real conflict between siblings over how to care for mom or dad. And it's very often after one of the parents has passed on, the other parent, there's been a shift in the family power balance. Uh, The surviving parent may have some pretty substantial health issues and needs a fair amount of care. Uh, and there may be kids, siblings, kids, sometimes in their 50s and their 60s themselves and sometimes older, uh, looking after 70, 80, 90-year-old parents scattered around the country, four and five brothers and sisters who simply don't agree on how much care mom or dad needs, who's best situated to give it, who feels like they're being overburdened because they're having the there may be a unmarried uh, sibling that lives fairly close, frequently a, a daughter, uh, who feels like everyone expects me to look after mom or dad and they're not doing their share. I had a case recently where uh, a gentleman had moved out of a long-term marriage into the home with one of his children there was a divided family of uh, of uh, uh, half brothers and sisters, uh, and the he had some cognitive impairment. Early Alzheimer's, it seemed like, was one of the diagnoses. He had some real difficulty getting around. Seeing he didn't want to live there anymore, but it was unclear he needed some care and someone to help make decisions to make sure he was well cared for and that the family, limited family assets, were used in a way to make sure he was cared for while the needs of the, the spouse were also being met. That was a, that was not an unusual media. There were about, in, in my experience, there were about uh, seven siblings involved, um, most in the room with legal counsel and uh, the, uh, the, the, the parents, and uh, at the end of... Uh, a few hours we had a plan that everyone agreed to. And this actually had started by the parties being in court. There was a, a fight over guardianship. It was decided the guardianship wasn't needed, but there was going to need to be some, someone had the power of attorney to make the decisions to make sure that he was being well cared for and that all the family would be consulted and informed and involved in making sure that uh, his needs were being met in a, in a good fashion. Thank you. You gave some really robust examples of some senior mediation types of cases that you've experienced. I just want to let listeners know who may have just joined us or recently joined us in the middle of the program that you are listening to the Texas Conflict Coach blog talk radio program. And we are talking with Bob Rudy, with, who is the president of senior mediation and decision making from Baltimore, Maryland. And we have discussed uh, how you have become um, a leader in the field of elder care and senior mediation, uh, your path to that. And we've also discussed the difference between uh, elder care and mediation. And we've also gone over some disputes that you just talked about uh, regarding visitation uh, with grandparents and also some family members, divorce mediation, just some disputes that those types of cases would be appropriate for 
senior mediation. So thank you, Bob, for going through those with us and really painting that picture of what is a great example of why senior mediation would be relevant and how it can be used. So one of the things that we get common questions about when I'm just as a practitioner, um, when people talk about senior elder uh, care mediation is the uh, you, one of the examples you gave uh, earlier is in an older person who might have lost uh, some cognitive function, uh, whether that's through Alzheimer's, dementia, or something else that might be going on for them. And so a common question that we get is, or are those individuals in the mediation? So part of this is, who is involved in these types of family, you know, that are actually in the mediation themselves. But if you could address, is the elder themselves in the mediation? And you talked about accommodating those mediations so that they can. So talk a little bit about who is in the room. That's an early decision in, in, in many kinds of mediations, who needs to be at the table, who needs to be at the room. And uh, I say at the table, and I've done some of these mediations in nursing homes and hospitals, so it's not always around the conference table. Uh, it depends. When someone, you know, we, we hear very frequently in uh, aging and senior mediations that, you know, dad shouldn't be involved in this discussion, it'll upset it. And uh, our well, they're old, they don't really understand what's being talked about here. So one of the things we have to be really aware of is the, the possibility of ages, of, that as people get older, they suddenly disappear, and they're considered not to not to be, need to have a voice in, in, in what affects them. I come in with a very strong uh, professional bias, I think, that, that to the fullest extent possible they should be asked and... Uh, if they can participate, uh, that opportunity should be given. It's, it's a joint decision. Um, but uh, I, uh, I remember one mediation very early, I think 2005, one, I think maybe the first one I did, in which it involved an 87-year-old mom, and um, I went and met and talked with her, um, she had been diagnosed by two doctors as not having the cog uh, cognitive capability to make their own decisions. Two other doctors had disagreed. Uh, depending, we found out later on on when the diagnosis was done. It was slightly. It was a short time after the she had had surgery. She was still suffering from the effects of the anesthesia, and she really was knocked out for a little while. And a few days later, about two or three weeks later, she was in a whole lot better shape. I said, you know, we're going to meet with your 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 five children. They're fighting over who's going to have control of making decisions for you. Are you want to be at the you got an attorney. You want to be at the mediation? She said, heck no. Last time we got in the middle of that kind of dispute with them, I had a heart attack the next day. No, tell me what happened. <laughs> so, okay, that, that, that pretty much made that decision. She was a pistol, but she had a lot of capability. She made very sure that her attorney understood exactly what she wanted him to do while he was there. We say that as people suffer some cognitive decline of decision-making, they may not have the ability to make all decisions. Perhaps they can't figure out how to pay the taxes. Sometimes I'm not sure I can figure out some of those financial decisions myself. But I do know, <laughs> and most people do, you know, what they want to have for supper or who they want to have as a roommate or where they want to live and those kinds of things. And they're generally quite willing to share that uh, sentiment. And if they're given a the chance, they will. So we try to provide opportunities for those conversations, and we recognize uh, that our sessions are more frequently held in a place that uh, may accommodate their comfort level. It could be their home rather than uh, the, quote, neutral space of the mediator's conference room. Uh, it may be a time of day that's more comfortable for them based on uh, their uh, fatigue level, their uh, need for rest, their medication level, all those kinds of things. Uh, we may take a lot more frequent breaks when they when they're just losing uh, attentiveness, and you have to be really sensitive to that. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, to the fullest extent possible, we try to make sure that uh, the person has a chance to be heard and uh, to participate if they want to. So just clarify one other thing, because I really want to get in, for us to get into the benefits um, to the parties themselves in doing this. 
you know, some families are pretty large, so we're not talking like, you know, 10, 20 people in the room trying to mediate. I mean, what is there a limit to who is in the room when you're dealing with these types of family caregiver disputes? I think the largest number I've had in the room on this kind of dispute was eight, was 19 people. Oh, so my God. Wow. Yeah, it was. 19. That involved, that involved uh, mom in a nursing home. One, two, three lawyers, one, two, three siblings in the room, another two on the telephone because the families were scattered around the country, and then nursing home personnel. So somehow that was the number that I remember. I've, I've had a couple in that same range. Uh, and uh, and we make sure everybody has a chance to, you know, participate and get hurt and do the standard uh mediation approaches of restating, reframing, uh, saying again what you've heard, make sure that there's clarity, make sure that everyone hears what is being said and, and has a chance to participate. So uh, it can be you know, one of the things I'm finding about this, that they are much, I do large group public policy facilitation, but these are much larger, a number of them, than I normally would do in certainly family mediations that tend to be, you know, uh, parents, maybe kids, and a couple of attorneys. They, they are frequently much larger. Uh, and and my primary senior mediation is around the caregiving issue, and, you know, it everybody wants to, generally speaking, virtually all the siblings that sometimes are still six and seven kids and sometimes in-laws and uh, and healthcare providers, geriatric care managers, sometimes there we have some professionals that bring some information and resource into the room at least part of the time that may be there, the nursing home staff that may have some concerns about, you know, what one of the siblings is bringing in proper food or medication and the mom up on into that one before. Um, they've got to be involved as well, plus their legal legal uh, staff. And and there's a higher likelihood. I'm old school, and I really like face to face ability to see the room and see what's going on, see the body language, and 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 participate as a mediator more that way to make sure that I understand what's going on. We do do conference calling in this area. I'm also going to add that I've talked mostly about mediation. Sometimes the, it is very difficult to get all the necessary people to the table, and we may shift to more of a coaching mode with some of the people that are involved in terms of how to go forward to try to continue the conversations with the, within the family to get to the necessary result. I also find instances where we start off with uh, – some party members, family members involved in the conversation, and it won't be resolved until, unfortunately, one or another of the family members says, you all figure it out, I'm out of here. That happens sometimes. It's a voluntary self-withdrawal from the process. Mm. Well, that was very shocking when you told me 19 because I had no idea that it could get so large. But but there are multiple uh, moving parts in these types of uh, situations and family caregiver disputes. I can understand why uh, you like the richness of it because there's so much complexity uh, to those kinds of cases. Uh, Tracy, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Okay. For the listeners, uh, Bob, that we have on the line, what do you think would be a key benefit for them if they're on the fence regarding using senior mediation services? What would be a key benefit? You know, I see it. Um, I see it as being a. Um, I find I've got a real bias. You understand that, you know, Patty. You you've heard me talk about an article on on engaging conflict uh, as a career trend. And part of the advice I got when I interviewed people in this area was find an area that you're passionate about and spend your time doing it. I like this area. I think these. These decisions around late stage, late life decision making are very, very important to people. Around to families and to the the, the older members of the family, the, the the moms and dads and the entire family, in terms of quality of life and the legacy that we leave and the relationships that we leave behind. And and I think uh, 
how we do our final transitions and final passages are also very important to us as well. Sometimes these are we don't get a lot of practice on this stuff. A value that I bring and other good, you know, other experienced, uh, qualified senior mediators bring is we've had experience working with families around these areas. So I think we can help dissipate the tension levels, help people come to decisions in loving, caring ways without litigation, without going through things that can sometimes destroy families, that can sometimes help rebuild and, and, and preserve and enhance and enrich the family experience going through this transition. So, you know, I provided some resources through the website so you can find uh, mediators, so you can read about it, so you can think about it. Uh, I, I encourage people to look at the these kinds of services can be useful in the kinds of decisions that you're going through with your family members aging. Uh, we're happy to help. Great. Thank so, you so much. What really spoke to me was uh, how you said that it's coming to a decision in a loving and caring environment. And I just think that's wonderful because when you're dealing with families in these situations, it is delicate. It's a delicate situation. There's a lot of emotions involved, and it has to do with family. So I really and I really appreciate how you said that. Well, and what we thank you. Do, and... What we usually do is we leave listeners with a call to action, Bob. Um, something where they can go out into the world and um, they can either get some more information on senior mediation or they can go out and they can find some resources where they can find a senior mediator. And you had mentioned some information previously regarding your website. So is there an assignment you would like to give listeners while they're on the line? Yeah, you know, I would encourage, we mentioned the website. I think it's uh, www.senior-mediation.org. And it's got I think some good resources and some links and some articles to other organizations. It also includes, uh, I wrote something, uh, it's called Maryland Edition, but it's pretty generic. It's called uh, Consumer's Guide to Senior Mediation. Uh, I encourage people to look at it. I think it, it sort of does a recap of some of what we've talked about. Maybe over the next day or two, if you're listening to this, and perhaps you're doing so because uh, when I do these workshops, I find about half the people in the room coming into my generation, uh, may if they reflect on what's happening with their family, what is going on? Just spend a little time thinking about what's happening in your family right now. What are what what can you see sometime down the road in the next year, two, three, four years of uh a transition involving uh one of the yourself perhaps or an older person in the family. Uh and uh how can that turn into a challenge? And to get the uh, everybody on board to try to work together to help provide the best transition, the best decisions, the best passage of the family resources, the businesses, uh, the caregiving. Uh, what are the impediments you might see, and is it possible? Where do you think that maybe mediation could be helpful in in uh, in in your family? That's great. Is there a final message that you would like to leave with listeners? Oh, I just uh, thanks so much for uh, tuning in today. Patty and Tracy, thank you for asking me to be on your show. I, I enjoy, as you know, uh, uh, I enjoy doing these mediations. I enjoy working with families, talking through these kinds of transitions. And, and uh, you know, our, our best wishes as we all grow older and care for ourselves. So. That's my, my party message for this evening. It was a pleasure right. having you and your knowledge on senior mediation and elder mediation, and you can just hear the passion in your voice. So thank you so much for sharing that with all of us. Thank you so much for having me. Talk to you thank again real soon. Thank you, Bob. Bye-bye. Bye, Patty. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Texas Conflict Coach. We hope you enjoyed the program. You can find all of our podcasts archived to listen at your convenience at texasconflictcoach.com or download the podcast at iTunes or Stitcher Radio. You can also become a Facebook fan of Conflict Connections. 
or Twitter me at TX Conflict Coach.